In the previous video, we talked about the primitive variables formulation of the Navier-Stokes equations for fluid mechanics. So these are partial differential equations for the velocities, u, v, u, v, and w, and then the pressure, p. We had to derive an equation for the pressure. That was the pressure Poisson equation. So we did that in the last video, and I encourage you to go back and take a look at that if you haven't already. In this video, we're going to look at another formulation of the equivalent physics in compressible Navier-Stokes equations for a Newtonian fluid but now using different dependent variables to characterize the fluid flow. Again, same exact physics, we'll start with the same Navier-Stokes equations, but now rather than the primitive variables u, v, and p, we'll be looking at two new variables, vorticity and stream function. Now, I could say a lot about the stream function and vorticity as quantities that characterize a fluid, but what I want to do here is just introduce them very quickly to you in one slide. There's much more that I could say about both of these quantities. They're excellent ways to interpret the nature of the flow that we're considering, but I'm just going to give you the mathematical definitions and show you why they're so useful. So starting with the stream function. So the stream function will use psi, and we'll think in terms of two dimensions, spatially x and y, and then time, so unsteady. For 2D incompressible flow in a Cartesian frame, we have these definitions of psi, relating them to the velocity components u and v. So u is partial psi partial y, and v is minus partial psi partial x. Now mathematically, what we're essentially doing is just defining a scalar function, the stream function, such that the continuity equation, which you'll remember from the previous video, is identically satisfied. So mathematically, this is actually quite powerful because what we're saying is, by defining this particular scalar function psi in this particular way, we can substitute this into the continuity equation, which enforces conservation of mass, and the equation is identically satisfied. What that means is, for any function psi of x, y, and t, it will satisfy the continuity equation. So we can essentially replace the equation with these definitions for the stream function. Now it turns out that the stream function goes much further than that. Not only does it serve to mathematically simplify the governing equations, it turns out that lines of constant psi, so if you were to draw a contour plot of lines of constant psi, those lines, those curves, are called streamlines. Streamlines are everywhere tangent to the velocity vector. So if you see a streamline through the flow, that's showing you the direction of the flow at every point along the streamline. So streamlines are a great way to show the direction of the flow. You can also infer volume flow rates and so on. So if that's familiar to you, great. If not, then go back and read more about the stream function. So it has this mathematical purpose in physical interpretation. Now the vorticity omega for 2D Cartesian coordinates is defined as follows. So omega is partial v partial x minus partial u partial y. Normally in a 3D flow, the vorticity is a vector. It would be del cross v, the curl of v. Remember from the last video, the divergence of a vector field tells us the expansion or contraction of the vector field. When you have the curl, del cross, that represents in some way the rotational aspects you think of moments in torsion, for example. So the curl gives you a representation, a quantification of the rotation of a vector field. But in 2D, you only have one component, and it's the component normal to the plane in which the flow. So you have a 2D flow in the plane, and then you have the basically the Z component is the only, only component of vorticity. And what it shows you is the rate of rotation of each point in x and y and t of that two-dimensional flow field. And it does follow the right-hand rule. So if your fingers are curling in the direction of rotation, your thumb is positive. Now before I get to the vorticity stream function formulation itself, please just bear with me. There is a pet peeve of mine that I just need to emphasize. Every time I talk about vorticity, I make this point. And that is vorticity is not equal to a vortex. They're very closely related. It is very often the case that when you have vorticity, you do have a vortex, but they are not equivalent. They are not the same. And I want to emphasize very quickly why that is the case and give you some examples. So vorticity, as I just said, is a spatial distribution of the rotation rates of individual, with an emphasis on individual, fluid particles. So this is a local measure. Each fluid particle is rotating with some direction, right-hand rule, and some rotation rate at every point. A vortex, on the other hand, is a spatially coherent region of fluid. So this is a whole region that's rotating together as a unit. So we think of an eddy, 
So you think of the, you know, when you pull a stopper out of your drain and the water swirls around and goes down the drain, that's a vortex. Now there might be vorticity in there as well, but that is a, a vortex. It's a, it is a region where it's experiencing this overall rotation. So what I'd like you to do is think about an example of a flow that has vorticity but does not have a vortex and another example where the flow has a vortex but no vorticity. So I'm not going to give you the answer now. We'll come back at the end of the video. Remind me. Come back at the end of the video and I'll give you an example of each. We'll put that aside for now. Now let's take those definitions of the vorticity and the string function and let's now develop equations that would govern those two quantities. We have the Navier-Stokes equations for u, v, and p and now we want to rewrite them for omega and psi. So here's how we do it. And this is going to lead to the vorticity transport equation. So what we're going to do is take the curl of the Navier-Stokes equations. You may remember in the previous video that to get the pressure Poisson equation for the primitive variables formulation, we took the divergence del dot of the Navier-Stokes equations. Now we're going to take the curl of the Navier-Stokes equations. In 2D, that's equivalent to taking partial partial x of the y momentum equation and partial partial y of the x momentum equation and the subtracting one from the other. When you do that, you get this mess. Now you can tell where the terms come from. Here you have the t derivatives, so those are the unsteady terms. All the rest of these are the rest of the convection terms. You have your pressure terms on the right hand side. And then anytime you see one over Reynolds number, those are the viscous terms. So let me colorize these, similar to what I did in the last video, so we can group the terms together. The first thing you'll notice is these pressure terms actually cancel. So the pressure gets eliminated as a variable, and we'll see how that is an advantage. Then we'll have the unsteady terms here. Uh, these are these purple terms. As you remember from the last video, I can't tell colors green, blue, brown, and purple, I guess. So for example, if we take the red terms here, so this is partial partial t of partial v partial x minus partial partial t of partial u partial y. So that looks like this. Then the green terms. So here we have u partial partial x of partial v partial x minus u partial partial x partial u partial y. So you see that here. Similarly for the blue terms, v partial partial y of this quantity now notice what happens in these terms. Both of these terms have a partial v partial x. So if you factor that out and leave what remains, that's partial u partial x plus partial v partial y. Then we have these black terms, very similar. They have the common minus partial u partial y factor, and then everything that's left. And then the brown terms lead to this, and the purple terms lead to this. Now notice what happens. Here you have a partial u partial x plus partial v partial y. What is that? That is zero from the continuity equation we had in the previous video. Same thing here, partial u partial x plus partial v partial y. So both of these are zero. These terms vanish because of continuity for a 2D incompressible flow. Now notice all of the other terms in parentheses here. Every single one is partial v partial x minus partial u partial y. What is that? That is the vorticity. So now we can take this form right here, get rid of these two terms, and all the other terms in parentheses we just have the vorticity. So we can rewrite it as follows here. You can see that I've done that here. So what we have is the unsteady term is now partial omega partial t plus u partial omega partial x plus v partial omega partial y. Those are convection terms is equal to 1 over the Reynolds number. Notice again the pressure is gone times partial squared omega partial x squared plus partial squared omega partial y squared. Now this equation should look very familiar. It looks almost identical to the original momentum equations that we had in the Navier-Stokes equations. The difference is, first of all, there's no pressure term. Second of all, now instead of velocities as the dependent variables, we have our vorticity. Remember, vorticity is a scalar in the 2D case. So this is the vorticity transport equation in two dimensions. It's a convection diffusion equation. We have convection of vorticity and we have diffusion of vorticity. And we've already talked a great deal about how to solve these types of equations, including these nonlinear terms that you see on the left-hand side.
All right, so 7.7 .7 gives us an equation for the vorticity if I know u and v. If I know psi, the stream function, then I know u and v because it's just partial derivatives of, of psi in order to get the velocities. So what would be the equation for the stream function? Well, if you just go back to the definition of the stream function that we started with and substitute that into the definition of vorticity, you get this equation here partial squared psi partial x squared plus partial squared psi partial y squared is equal to minus omega. This you'll recognize as a Poisson equation. If I know omega, the vorticity from the vorticity transport equation, I can then use this equation to solve for the stream function psi. So this is very similar to the pressure Poisson equation, but now we have a Poisson equation for the stream function. So in the end then, we have two equations for two unknowns. We have the vorticity transport equation, but we only have one of them. And then we have the Poisson equation for the stream function. Two equations for the two unknown scalars, psi and omega. We connect the velocity to psi through the definitions of the stream function that we had at the very beginning. Now if we have an unsteady form as I wrote it here, then the vorticity transport equation is parabolic. If it's steady, then it would be elliptic. And then we have a Poisson equation for the stream function, and that's always elliptic regardless of whether it's steady or unsteady. So we either have two elliptic equations or one parabolic and one elliptic equation that are solved for these two dependent variables. Again, the pressure terms are gone, so we do not need to calculate the pressure in order to advance the solution in the calculation. We can always get the pressure using the pressure Poisson equation that we had in the last video at any point in time but we don't need to do that calculation in order to advance the solution for stream function and vorticity. So you might see one of the advantages already, and that is that the vorticity stream function formulation only requires two equations for two unknowns in the two-dimensional case. Remember, for primitive variables, we had three equations for u, v, and p, three equations for three unknowns in the 2D case. So we've eliminated the need for one of those equations, so we have a light, slightly more compact formulation should simplify the numerical solution to some extent. Again, we haven't changed the physics at all. We're just representing that physics in terms of a new set of variables. So that's all good. The problem is it does not extend well to three dimensions. In three dimensions, first of all, the vorticity now is a vector and therefore requires three equations for the vorticity components in the x, y, and z directions rather than just one in the 2D case. So we go from one equation to three vorticity transport equations in the 3D. In addition, if you've ever seen that equation, there are additional terms in the equation in the 3D form for stretching and tilting. So not only do we have more equations, the equations get more complicated because there's additional terms to account for this additional physics that can occur with these vorticity fields. In addition, there is no stream function definition in 3D. In order to use this definition for the stream function, you need to be in a 2D or axisymmetric setting. It does not extend to 3D. There is a vorticity velocity potential formulation that you can use to kind of mitigate that issue to some extent, but it still doesn't reduce the number of equations. It's still a very large problem. Now the other issue that we have in the vorticity stream function formulation is we do not have straightforward boundary conditions for the vorticity. If you understand stream function and understand how mathematically and physically it works, we do have boundary conditions for the stream function that we get from the velocity field, but there are no natural boundary conditions for vorticity, and we'll need to figure out in the next video how we address that issue. So having said all that, those various pros and cons, based on remarks three and four, notwithstanding six, the boundary conditions, we'll, we will address that. The vorticity stream function formulation is typically considered to be the preferred formulation in 2D incompressible flows. Two equations instead of three. We generally want the vorticity in the stream function anyway because they're very useful, interesting quantities to track, to plot, to interpret the flow. So this is a very popular formulation in the 2D case. In 3D, we typically then go to the primitive variables. There's really no advantage to the vorticity stream function formulation, so typically we go to, back to the primitive variables formulation, which goes from three to four equations. It's not that big of a hit as compared to the 2D case. So having said all that, general purpose CFD codes used in industry, so commercial codes, open source codes like open foam, fluent, and so on, generally use the primitive variables formulation for any flow.
But again, we do have this advantageous formulation in the 2D incompressible case. Okay, so let's go back and address this vorticity versus vortex question. So let me give you an example of a flow that has vorticity, but no vortex. Have you been able to think of one? Well, here's an example. When you have a boundary layer, just think of the simple Blasius boundary layer. So the velocity profile looks like this. You have no slip at the surface. You have zero for no slip at the surface, then it increases as you move away from the surface. So here, if you have a fluid particle, the fluid particle above is going a little bit faster than the one below, and so you get a, you get a rotation. And in fact, it's a negative rotation. So you get negative vorticity corresponding to fluid particles within a boundary layer. No one would look at a boundary layer, a Blasius boundary layer in particular, and say there's a vortex there, that there's some global regional rotation of the fluid. Certainly there is on a local point-by-point -point basis, each point is rotating because of the frictional effects within the boundary layer, but there is no vortex. Okay, that's the easy one. What about a situation where you have a vortex, but no vorticity? This does not really occur in nature, per se, but there is a scenario that you may be aware of, that you may have heard, and that is what's called an irritational vortex. And that's actually why it's called an irritational vortex. So this is a vortex in the true sense of the term. There is a body of fluid that's rotating around together in a coherent fashion, but if you calculate the vorticity, it turns out that the vorticity is zero everywhere throughout the flow, except for at the very center itself. So this is kind of like, the analogy I like to use is of a Ferris wheel. So you know, you have a Ferris wheel, you have these little buckets going around like so, and this thing is rotating. So it looks like a vortex, right? You got this whole thing that's rotating around. But each bucket is not rotating. Each bucket keeps its same orientation as it moves around. So each bucket does not have any vorticity. It's not rotating, otherwise it would dump the people out. So it's rotating around, you have a vortex, but no vorticity. Now again, in reality, if you were to plot the vorticity in a vortex, it's not gonna be focused as a singularity just at the center, which is the case here for this ideal vortex, this irritational vortex. So it'll be spread out more evenly, more smoothly. But there is this extreme case of a vortex that does not have vorticity. In most cases where you see a region of vorticity of a single sign, more often than not, that represents some vortex in that location. But I just want you to be careful, these are not equivalent. In the next video, then we're gonna address this question of how do we get boundary conditions for vorticity? So we'll talk about the boundary conditions we have for stream function, and then we'll discuss how we can get boundary conditions for the vorticity as well.